Hi and welcome to my course Windows Server 2022 Real World Hands-On for Beginners. First of all I'd like to thank you so much for signing up to the course. I'd like to thank all of my students for the support they give me both on LinkedIn and Udemy. You guys are just awesome. I try to make my courses real world hands-on. These are things that you need to know in order to survive in the real world. So hopefully in this course you'll learn how to get up and running with Windows Server 2022. The principles that you use in 2022 you can use also with Server 2019 and 2016 as well. So again thank you so much for your awesome support. If you have any questions please reach out to me at LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to answer them if I can. Now and again I also run live courses as well via Zoom so keep an eye out on LinkedIn for those courses and you are more than welcome to join. Again all of my training both live and all of my Udemy courses are all free. I just want to help you guys strive and become good engineers. I know you guys are awesome so again thank you from the bottom of my heart for the awesome support and encouragement that you give me that, that helps me to make more courses for you. So again I hope you have fun learning this course. I had so much fun making it for you and I look forward to seeing you in future courses. Hi as you can see I've gone ahead and I've logged into Oracle VirtualBox. I'm using Oracle VirtualBox because it's free and it's absolutely amazing. You can also use VMware Workstation Player. This is also free by VMware. Again you could also use Hyper-V as well by Microsoft. That's also free as well. But in case you don't have Hyper-V or you don't want to use VMware Player, you can use Oracle VirtualBox. And as you can see, you can go ahead and access Oracle VirtualBox from virtualbox.org and download it. And you can run all of your Windows and Vista and Linux and uh, Mac OS operating systems. Or you can go ahead to VMware Workstation and you can go ahead and download Workstation Player. Again, this is free. If you wanted to buy VMware Workstation, you can go ahead and buy the full product. But in our case, we are going to concentrate on using Oracle VirtualBox because it's free. So again, once you've got Oracle VirtualBox installed, open it up and click New. I'm going to go ahead and give my server a name because we are going to install Windows Server. So I'm going to call mine ROC DC03 because DC meaning domain controller because we're going to make this a domain controller. I'm going to accept the default location. You can change that location if you like. Again, I'm using a Microsoft Windows operating system. If I was using Linux, I could select Linux or Mac OS or FreeBSD. But let's go with Microsoft Windows. Again, I'm going to click in the versions. And I'm going to scroll all the way to the top. And as you can see, we can do everything from Windows 3.1 all the way down to Windows 11 and other types of windows but in our case we are going to select windows server 2019 so i'm going to go ahead and select uh, windows server 2019 even though i'm installing windows server 2022 it doesn't matter because windows 2019 and 22 and 2016 use the same underlining architecture so you don't need to stress out too much that you don't see Windows Server 2022. I'm sure with newer versions of Oracle Box we will see Windows Server 2022 added there. So I'm going to go ahead and click Next. I'm going to give my virtual machine some memory. I'm going to give it say just over 8 gigs of memory. Click Next. I'm going to go ahead and create that disk. And now this is really cool because we can create a VDI or VirtualBox disk image or an Oracle image because Oracle own VirtualBox. We could also use a VHD image, which is what Hyper-V uses. Hyper-V uses VHD and VHDX. So we could actually import this virtual machine if we wanted to into Azure. Of course, we've got VMDKs and uh, VMware uses v VDMK. So if you've got a VMware player, VMware workstation, or VMware vSphere or ESXi server, you could also import this virtual machine directly into VMware. There's no reason to convert the disk. But in our case, we're going to just accept a VDI. Now we've got dynamic disk and fixed disk. Now dynamic disk will use a lot of our disk space. And we can adjust and add more disks as we need it. But we may not have that flexibility in our physical box. We may have a certain hard drive space. And we may only have a certain amount of free hard drive 
space available to run our VMs. So select fixed sized, click next, and let's make this VM say 32 gig. We don't need it any bigger because I've got 32 gig free on my hard disk. So I'm gonna go ahead and click create. Now what this is gonna do, this is gonna go out and it's gonna provision that hard disk for us. Once, I mean that uh, virtual hard disk for us. Once that virtual hard disk has been provisioned, we can go ahead and install our Windows operating system on that disk. Bear in mind that it's sharing the resources of your physical box. So it's sharing my memory, it's sharing my hard drive. So whatever hard drive and free memory I have available, it's gonna utilize that. So bear that in mind. Again, once you create and provision um, your virtual disk, this can take anywhere from one to two minutes or depending on the specs of your physical box. So we'll just wait for this to complete and then we'll carry on with the lab. And as you can see, that didn't take too long. And you can now see I have Rock DC01 in my menu here. You will notice I've got these other VMs here. That's because I created them before. You may not have these VMs. You may only have one VM. So let's go ahead and get Windows installed on this hard disk that we've just provisioned. So go up to the top and click on settings, the little gear icon at the top here, and then come down to storage. And this little DVD icon is where we are gonna go ahead and use this icon to mount our ISO that we downloaded from Microsoft. Again, I'm just gonna quickly bounce over to networking. I just wanna show you something. We're gonna use NAT. Now, what does NAT do? Well, NAT allows this virtual adapter to be attached to the real network of the host OS. In other words, it's going to allow us to have live internet access sharing my real network. Again, you can select in the adapter here and you may want to choose only host only or internal. I encourage you to go ahead and play around, but in my case, we're gonna use NAT because we want internet access. So I'm gonna bounce back to storage. I'm gonna click on this little DVD icon. I'm gonna click on the DVD icon on the menu here underneath attributes, and I'm gonna say choose a disk file. And as you can see, I've downloaded uh, the Windows Server 22 ISO. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that and click OK. Now I'm gonna go ahead and click Start. And this is gonna go ahead and start that virtual machine for us. And then we can go ahead and start the installation of Windows. And as you can see, that virtual machine is starting up. So we'll just give it a second to fire up. And there we go. As you can see, it's automatically detected the Windows 2022 ISO. Again, you can download these ISOs free from Microsoft and you can try them out and really learn to get to grips with Windows. So once the ISO has fired up, I'm gonna go ahead and select my time and currency format. So I'm in New Zealand, so I'm gonna scroll all the way up until I find New Zealand and I'm gonna select New Zealand and click next. I'm gonna click the installation or the install button and this is gonna go away and uh, do a few checks before the installation begins. And then we're gonna go ahead and accept the license agreement. Now, if you notice it's asking for a key, don't worry if you don't have a key, this is not gonna stop you from installing Windows Server and using Windows Server. So go ahead and say, I don't have a product key. Now we've got Windows Standard, Data Center, Desktop Experience, Data Center, and Data Center Desktop Experience as well. So what's the difference between Standard Desktop Experience and the standard version. Well, the standard version and the data center versions are the core versions. They will not install the GUI or the graphical user interface. So if you want to have the graphical user interface, select the desktop experience. In most cases in the real world, you would select the desktop experience. So I'm gonna select Windows Server 2022 standard desktop experience. I'm gonna click next. This is gonna uh, pop up the license agreement. I'm gonna accept the license agreement and go next. And I'm not doing an upgrade, I'm doing a clean install. So select custom, select our hard disk that we just provisioned, that 32 gig drive, and click next. Now what Windows is gonna do, it's gonna go away and install for us. And this can take a couple of minutes, anywhere from five to 10 minutes to install. And you'll find during the installation process, Windows will probably reboot two or three times. And this also applies to the real world. If you're installing Windows Server, 
on our physical real server. It'll also do a couple of reboots because this is detecting and installing various drivers. So we'll just wait for this installation to complete and then we'll continue with the lab. And as you can see, Windows has uh, finished inst installing. It's now doing a reboot. Now, once Windows Server reboots, we are going to get a message. Do you want to boot from the CD or DVD? Uh, do not press any key because if you do, you're going to restart the installation from scratch all over again. So just ignore that and let Windows uh, boot into uh, itself. And we'll just wait for a moment for it to do its thing. And bear in mind, this can reboot two or three times during the installation because it's detecting things like network drivers, graphics adapters, and it's also installing a few other bits and pieces in the background. So this will start services and stop services. So just be patient while this um, happens. And again, it will reboot again. Do not press that CD or DVD uh, key because it will begin the installation from scratch and we don't want to do that. So let's wait for this installation to complete. See it rebooted, so I'm going to go ahead and type in a password. And click finish. And that will go ahead and finish the installation off for us. And we'll just wait a little bit because Windows Server is applying a few settings for us. And as you can see, that was really quick. So go up to the top underneath uh, input, select keyboard, and then click Control uh, alt delete and this will allow us to log into our server. Log in with that password that you created. It's creating that user profile for us. So we'll just wait for us to log in and then we can carry on with the lab. And as you can see, that didn't take too long to log in. If you notice, Server Manager is fired up by default. So I'm going to go ahead and close this down. Now, in the real world, we would turn this off because if our server reboots, that means every time our server does a reboot, it may do a Windows update or we may need to reboot it for, for some reason, it's going to continually pop up. And this can be a bit of an annoyance. So go over to Manage, select Server Manager Properties, and say do not start server manager automatically at logon and click OK. Normally what I do is I right mouse click on the toolbar here and pin this to the toolbar because I'm forever in server manager all the time. So I'm going to go ahead and close this down. In case you don't have it here, you can always go over to the start menu and you can select server manager from here and this will fire up server manager as well. So once you install your server, one of the things that we need to do, and we'll cover this in the next lab, is we need to rename our server, and we need to give our server a static IP, and we need to turn on remote desktop, because we manage that server via an RDP connection. We want that server to have a static IP, because if it doesn't have a static IP, the IP may change because it's getting a dynamic IP from DHCP, and if that changes, then we can't connect. So Again, what we've done in this lab is, is we have just learned how to install a plain server from the ground up. Now, if a server is not running Active Directory, it's known as a member server. And member servers could be Exchange servers, File servers, and SQL servers. If servers have Active Directory running on them, they are known as Domain Controllers or DCs. And we can have multiple DCs. And we'll cover that as we work through our lab. But in this lab, we have just learned how to install Windows Server from the ground up, a plain Jane member server, and we'll configure this member server as a domain controller. So I'd like to thank you for viewing, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab. As you can see, I've gone ahead and logged back into our server. And if you notice, I'm dragging this little screen here, this the corner of the screen here, and you notice my main uh, VM is not resizing uh, to take up the whole screen and that's because we need to install some additions in VMware workstation you would install the VMware tools and this would allow it to uh, resize the screen it allows that VMware workstation uh, PC to run smoothly the same thing with Oracle VirtualBox we need to install the, the tools 
that allow that virtual machine to run a lot smoother and do a whole lot of cool things. So go to the top and select devices and then say insert guest editions CD image. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to click on File Explorer. I'm going to click this PC and you can see here, here's my guest uh, editions. I'm going to go ahead and double click on that and this will go ahead and allow me to install those guest editions. Click Next, click Next, click Install and this will install and it will ask for a restart and that's absolutely fine. We want to, to restart because this is going to uh, give us uh, better performance, it's going to adjust us, our graphics so that we can actually use our virtual box to its full extent. So I'm going to go ahead and click finish and this will go ahead and reboot that virtual machine. So we'll just wait for that VM to reboot and then we'll log back in again. Now if you notice you'll see I'm getting a bit more of a full screen and you'll see we'll go and adjust the screen to see if that uh, those tools have taken effect and you can see those tools are kicking in so I'm going to go ahead and click on uh, input I'm going to go to keyboard I'm going to select alt control delete I'm going to log into that VM press enter and that's going to allow me to log into my Windows server now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, drag this and then hopefully this will uh, shortly it will allow me to uh, resize automatically to um, my uh, screen so that I, I can use that. So we'll just give that a second and there we go as you can see now it's allowing me to resize and that's one of the reasons why we want to install those additions but also if we come down to devices and we go to drag and drop I can now drag and drop uh, files directly from my host desktop Windows 10 PC to my server. So I can choose uh, bi-directional and I can go ahead and drag a file over. So if I went ahead and dragged a file over and just said copy and dropped it, there we go. And I dragged that straight from my desktop into my server. So it's really cool that you can do that. So that's how we install those additions. And those additions are important because they allow our Oracle VirtualBox VM to run a lot smoother and give, give us better performance. And that completes this lab on installing virtual machine additions. In the next lab, we'll go ahead and assign a static IP address, set up RDP, and rename our server. Hi, as you can see, the next thing we need to do on our server is we need to assign it a static IP, we need to turn on remote desktop, and we need to rename our server. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to find out some IP inf information. So go ahead in the search and type in CMD. This will bring up the command prompt. Click on the command prompt to bring it up. Let's go ahead and type in ipconfig slash all. So we say ipconfig forward slash all. This will bring us our IP info. And this is the IP info that we need. So we want to go and change our server to have a static IP address of 10.0.2.15. We want to give it a subnet mask of 255.255.0. We want to give it a default gateway of 10.0.2. And of course, add the DNS server of 192.168.1.254. So how do we do that? Well, there's a number of ways that you can get to your network adapter. We can go to our network adapter by right mouse clicking and saying open network in, uh, settings and go to Ethernet and say change adapter options. We could also open up control panel and go to control panel. We can go ahead and just say use large icons. And of course we can go to network and sharing center in our control panel and we can say change adapter settings. That'll take us there as well. So there's two ways to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this down and I'm gonna go ahead and use the control panel option. I'm gonna right mouse click my Ethernet adapter. I'm gonna go properties. And this is going to bring up the properties of my Ethernet adapter. I want to select TCP 
IP version 4 and select properties. And if you notice, it's grayed out. And the reason it's grayed out is because we've been assigned a dynamic IP address, which means it'll expire and change after a certain period of time. So we don't want that to change. We actually need to have a static IP so we can remote desktop to this server because this server is going to be a domain controller. In fact, all your servers should have static IP addresses assigned to them. So let's go ahead and assign that static IP address. So we said that IP address was 10.0.2.15. Sorry, 10.0.2.15. Let's go and give it a subnet mask. 255.255. Let's go and give it that gateway address, which was 10.0.2.2. Dot two. Let's go and give it that DNS address. Now we're going to install Active Directory on this server. So we want this server also to have DNS. So we put the service IP and of course then we put that other alternate which is 192.168.1.254 and then we go ahead and click OK and click Close. And now, if you notice, my network adapter has dropped off here. It says there's no internet access, and it is now fired up again. So if I right mouse click on my adapter and go properties and click the TCP IP version 4, we can see now we have a static IP. And the reason it is a static, because we can see the numbers in there. It's not a dynamic IP address. So let's close that down. Let's close that down. And let's see if we can ping Google. So. I'm going to type in CLS to close that down, and I'm going to type in ping www.google.com, and there we go. We can ping Google, which is fantastic. Our server is live, connected to the internet. We can do Windows updates and a whole lot of other things that we may require in the future. So I'm going to close that down. I'm going to access Server Manager by clicking the Server Manager shortcut here in my toolbar. Again, if you don't see Server Manager here, you can always go to your Start menu and select Server Manager from here. So we'll wait for Server Manager to fire up. Once Server Manager has loaded, click Local Server. Then let's go down and let's go ahead and turn on Remote Desktop. So I could go to Remote Desktop here and it would say, for example, if it was off like this, I would come over to Remote Desktop and I would go ahead and turn that on. So I would come to Remote Desktop, click Enabled and click Allow Remote Desktop and allow all connections. Obviously in the real world you would actually want to turn this one on because this allows authentication and this is much more prevalent. But if you've got older VMs uh, you actually want to take this off. So I'm going to click Apply and click OK. So now we've turned on Remote Desktop. So that's fantastic. So let's go ahead and change our server name. So go right to the top here underneath computer name, move over to the side, select the computer name and don't type the computer name in there because that's not going to do anything. We need to click the change button. So let's go and call this ROC DC03, short for Rock Domain Controller 03. We're going to go ahead and click OK. And if you notice, it's not on a domain. It says work group. So we still have to install the AD role to put it onto the domain. So I'm going to click OK and click OK. Now this is going to ask for a restart and this is again will happen in the real world as well. So go ahead and click restart now and that will restart our server and that will uh, enable all of those configurations that we've just made. So we'll just wait for the server to uh, restart. It'll be really quick and then we'll log back into the server and just make sure that our changes uh, have taken effect. So again, go to the top, click Input underneath Keyboard, select Alt, Control, Delete, type in your server password and press Enter. This will log us straight into our Windows Server. So let's go and see if our settings have taken effect. So again, click Server Manager. I'm clicking that Server Manager icon. I'm waiting for Server Manager to fire up. I'm going to local servers and there we go our name has changed remote desktop is enabled and we're pretty much ready to go so again we can also uh, click on file explorer I can right mouse click on this PC and go properties 
and this will also give me some more information and there we go our device name is rock 03 and we are running windows server 2022 standard so that's how you assign a static ip address that's how you turn on remote desktop to your server again if i went down into properties and of course you can go through here and we can go to uh, remote desktop and we can see remote desktop has been turned on as well so again in this lab you have learned how to assign a static ip to your server you've learned how to rename your server and you've learned how to turn on remote desktop i'd like to thank you for viewing and i look forward to seeing you in the next video as you can see i've gone ahead and logged into my server again so select server manager we'll wait for server manager to fire up once server manager has fired up select manage and select add roles and features then go ahead and click next we want to do a role based feature installation we want to put it on rock dc03 uh, click next and we want to choose active directory domain services and when we select that it's going to add a whole lot of other features for us that's absolutely fine click add features click next click next and if you notice we can actually configure this as well to work with azure active directory you can see this here at the bottom click next click restart if it does want a restart and click install now what this is going to do this is going to go away and install the active directory domain uh, services feature it's going to install the roles once the roles have been installed we will then go and promote this member server to a domain controller and again depending on your resources this can take anywhere from about one to maybe three or four minutes to complete so we'll just wait for this to complete and then we'll carry on with the lab and as you can see the role has been installed but we now need to promote the server to the domain controller and we can click promote the server to domain controller and we get this little warning notification here telling us we still have to do some bits and pieces we could also export those settings if we wanted to to put it onto another domain so click let's promote this domain controller let's just say by accident you close that don't worry you can go to the notifications at the top here and you could click on this little flag and click promote this domain controller now this is going to promote this domain controller we could add this to an existing domain we could add this domain controller to an existing forest but in our case we want to create a new forest and we need to give it a domain name so i'm going to call this uh, domain name uh, uh, let's call it uh, rockly.com now with the older versions of server prior to uh, 2016 you'd have to type rockly.co or microsoft.local uh, sorry um, you couldn't use the .com for some reason it kind of gave you some errors but now with 2016 and 2019 we can type in that full domain name so like my dom domain name is rockley.com or if I wanted to I could just call it uh, rock.com whatever your domain name may be so let's use rock.com let's go next now this is just going to go away it's going to do some checks and now it's asking us about our forest functional level now if we left this at 2016 that means if we had older generation servers they would not be able to connect or communicate with active directory so it's always good sense to find out what servers you have you might have i don't know 2008 servers still running in your environment at least we can we can work with those 2008 servers if you wanted to so again it all depends on your environment at the end of the day what uh, legacy servers you have since we don't have any other older servers we're going to stay with 2016 but i thought i would just mention that now we want to go ahead and type in a password and this password is to pro uh, to protect active directory from being uninstalled by accident and the reason you would do that because if someone went along and uninstalled active directory you would lose all of your settings and all of your information and you would be in hot water so let's go ahead and type in a password
Let's type in that password again. And let's click next. Now this is going to go away. It's we're obviously going to get this warning. I wouldn't be too concerned. That's absolutely fine. Click next. Now this is going to go and give our domain name a shortened version. So in other words, we can allow up to 32 characters. So if you had a really long dom domain like Ryan O'Connell at Microsoft.com or something like that, and was really long, it would abbreviate it and make it shorter. So our NetBIOS name is going to be Rock because our domain name was Rock. Obviously, if it was Rock one two three four twenty seven Auckland one nine seven six, it would truncate that back to uh, some uh, a shorter name. So that's what that does. So let's click next on the NetBIOS name. And we'll just wait for that uh, setting to kick in. Now, in the real world, what you would do is you wouldn't install all of these Active Directory sysvol and database files on C drive. You would install it on an F drive or an E drive or another partition. The reason you would do that, because if your server crashed in the real world, you would be in hot water because you, there's a, a big chance you could lose your Active Directory schema and you'd have to reinstall AD from a backup. So it's always good practice to install these sysvol and NTDS uh, files on a separate dedicated drive. It doesn't have to be a big drive. It can be 10 gig. 10 gig is, is more than enough to do that. It doesn't need to be big. But in our case, because this is a lab, we're just going to install it on C drive. I'm going to click Next. I'm going to scroll down. Again, I'm going to accept all these settings. I'm going to go ahead and click Next. And this is going to go away. It's going to do a validation check to make sure that everything's right. If something is wrong, we'll get a whole lot of warnings and it won't allow us to install Active Directory. And as you can see, we've met all the prerequisites that is needed to install Active Directory. Do not worry about these DNS issues. They're there with all servers, you, you know, don't stress. As long as the prereqs are completed and you get this like uh, teal color icon here and this green icon here, you'll be good to go. Now we click install. Now we are actually promoting the server to an Active Directory domain controller. And again, this can take anywhere from five to 15 minutes to install because that's doing a lot of stuff in the background as it goes ahead and configures AD. So it's adding all sorts of features and uh, s tools for us in order to use Active Directory. It's setting up the group policy management console. It's setting up a wide range of features. So again, this is now a waiting game where we just sit and wait while it goes ahead and updates those objects. So I'll just uh, wait for this to complete. Again, it shouldn't take too long to complete. can see it's installed and Active Directory is now going to do a reboot so we'll just wait for this reboot to complete it shouldn't take too long and then we can actually log back into our server and this would apply to all servers even physical servers as well so just bear in mind if you are installing Active Directory it's gonna uh, install the roles add all those different features and then ask for a restart. If it doesn't, it's always good to go ahead and restart the, uh, the server anyway once those roles have completed. It's just good practice. You can see our server is now ready to uh, for us to log in. And if I go to input, go to keyboard, and select Alt, Control, Delete, you'll notice a difference now. You can see here it says rock backslash administrator. <clears throat> so you'll notice at the bottom here, we've got rock backslash administrator and other users. This is now logging, will allow us to log on to the domain using domain admin credentials that we have, as well as any other user if we wanted to log on. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in that password, our server password. And log on to our Active Directory domain controller and we'll just give it a second to fire up and there we go now I'm gonna pop over back into server manager
and we'll wait for server manager to fire up as you can see if I move over to my local servers we should very shortly see Active Directory popping up over here so we'll just give it a second to complete loading as you can see uh, server manager has complete loading and you'll notice we've got ADS here we've got our DNS here so this is Active Directory done if we come over to the top here you can see we don't have any message uh, any error messages so let's go back to our dashboard and you'll notice we now have Active Directory domain services installed and to confirm that we do have Active Directory domain services installed let's minimize this let's click the start menu and let's go to administrative tools and you will now see we have Active Directory administrative center Active Directory users and computers we could right mouse click that and we could go ahead and say pin that to the taskbar if we opened up Active Directory users and computers you can see there's our domain and now we have our very first domain controller up and running and we can now go ahead and add users set up group policy and add OUs add groups and we'll do this in the next lab so in this lab you learned how to install Active Directory how to promote a member server to a domain controller and I look forward to seeing you in the next video so in this lab we're going to learn about OU so I'm just going to click the icon here to take this to full screen so you can see things a lot better so I'm going to go ahead and click start go to administrative tools and I'm going to select Active Directory users and computers this is going to open up the Active Directory blade for us and we're going to go ahead and create an OU so if I right mouse click on my main domain and come down and say uh, new and select organizational unit I'm going to call this organizational unit New Zealand and I'm going to click OK and that's going to create an organizational unit called New Zealand now we can go one step further we can actually nest OUs so again I would click on New Zealand right mouse click on New Zealand so that it's highlighted and then go new organizational unit and I'll call this organizational unit Auckland and click OK so now I've got an organizational unit called New Zealand with a sub unit called Auckland and I can go one step further in Auckland I can make sure that Auckland is clicked right mouse click on on Auckland I can go new and I can say an organizational unit and I can go and say management and I can click OK and I can go ahead on the Auckland unit again I can say new OU and I can go ahead and I can call this one sales and click OK so now underneath New Zealand I have Auckland and I could have all my users in Auckland there if I had my other town like Hamilton or Sydney I could create another OU called Hamilton and put all of uh, my users in Hamilton if I had offices in Hamilton and the same applies if I had offices in the UK or offices in Chicago or offices in Los Angeles it doesn't really matter uh, having Active Directory and using these organizational units is really crucial for management but not only that it keeps Active Directory uh, nice and tidy so let's click on our management OU let's right mouse click and let's say new and let's go and create a user so I'm going to call this user Jack Reacher and I'll call the user Jack Jack R I'd go next I would give the user a password I'll type that password in for that user and I would say that that password changes when he logs in again there's a whole lot of things we can do around our users we could say well the password never expires or hey the user can't change the password or you know the user must uh, change password at next logon and if you notice we can't have too many checkboxes ticked it won't allow us to do that so we have to take off the password expire again we have to take off the uh, the password cannot change in order if we want stuff to work so in our case let's just say that the um, the password never expires and the user can't change the password just because this is a lab and I'll go ahead and click next 
and click finish and this would go ahead and create that user for us you can see once that user has been created if I right mouse click on that user and I go to properties I can add that user to be a member of various groups if I clicked add and I clicked advanced and clicked find now I could add them to a wide range of groups and we'll cover groups and users as we move through um, this training session or the, the training course I mean so I'm going to go ahead and close that down and click OK so now we've created our new user let's say our user phones us up and says hey I forgot my password I don't know what my password is that's pretty easy you can right mouse click on the user say reset password you could type in a new password for that user and we could unlock that user's account because obviously um, it may be locked and we could click OK and that password would be changed then we'll get hold of our user and say that's your new password but let's say uh, Jack Reacher is not supposed to be in the management OU he's supposed to be in the sales OU well that's pretty easy to move him all you do is you click the user and drag him and drop him into the sales OU and you'll get a little warning saying are you sure you want to do this we say yes we do and he's no longer in the management OU but he is now in the sales OU so OUs are important for managing and keeping AD nice and clean we can apply group policies to OUs which we'll talk about much later on again if we have our default OUs if we go to our domain controller OU you can see our DC is in there if we go to computers OUs there's no computers as we add computers to the domain they'll appear in this uh, OU then we have users these are our default active directory users like we've got domain users we've got uh, key admins schema admins enterprise admins so there's a lot of default users that uh, we can add in to uh, active directory as we work with active directory again um, we've got a lot of built-in accounts as well and these built-in accounts allow us to be part of groups and these groups are a lot easier to manage in Active Directory instead of managing individual users it's a lot easier to add them to a group to manage but again this lab is all about creating an OU let's say for example we didn't want that OU in sales um, or we didn't want that management OU you just click on the OU right mouse click and you can go down and say delete and that would delete that OU again you could recreate that OU if you wanted to if you had a backup you could restore that OU and we'll talk about Active Directory Recycle Bin a bit later on in the training but again this lab is designed just to get you familiar with creating an OU deleting an OU and creating a user and moving a user uh, in and out of those OUs again if you don't want that user you can go ahead and click delete and that would delete that user as well if I went into my New Zealand OU at the top here and I right mouse clicked and I said delete I now get a warning are you sure you want to delete this unit and you can see here it's telling you we have sub uh, OU's and if you delete this it's going to delete everything in that subtree so that's something you need to be uh, aware of so if I say yes uh, delete that that would delete all of those OU's and they'd be gone all of those users would be gone all of those groups would be gone and the only way to recover them is to use um, an Active Directory uh, authoritative restore or Active Directory recycle bin or you may have a piece of uh, software running a backup software like Veeam or uh, another brand of software that you use to backup with then you'd have to restore using that backup technology that you have in place again I hope you've learned a little bit more about OU's again we can apply uh, group policies to OU's as well and we'll talk about that later on so I'd like to thank you for viewing and look forward to seeing you in the next video as you can see I've logged back into my domain controller and I'm back at Active Directory so in the last session we spoke about creating a basic OU and creating a basic user so what about groups so as you can see here I've got an OU called groups so I'm going to right mouse click on that uh, OU called groups and go new and you've guessed it I'm going to select group and I'm going to call this group uh, Auckland 
sales. And I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And that's how we create a group. Again, let's redo that. It's pretty easy. If I said new group, I could call this one um, Auckland Management. And I could click OK. And that would create that group for us. Also, if I right mouse clicked on those groups, I could rename those groups. I could go to those group properties and I could go ahead and add members to those groups. So let's go ahead and add some members to our groups. So how do we do that? Make sure you navigate to the group you've created, select the group, right mouse click and go properties and go ahead and click the tab members, click add, click advanced and click find now and we can go through and we could find our users now I'm going to show you a few ways to do that let's go and add Jack and Sally to that group and click OK if you notice their name is underlined I could go ahead and click OK I could click apply and click OK now that adds uh, uh, those users to that group and if I double click on that group and I go to members I can see Sally and Jack are now a member of that group if I didn't want them to be a member of that group that's pretty easy I just click remove say yes and I'd go ahead and click apply and that would remove Sally from that group if I wanted to add Sally to that group again I could go down to properties and I could go to members and I could click add and I could type in her name SA Sally and I could do a check and it's found her name Sally Crane I could click OK and click apply and I've added now Sally Crane to that Auckland sales group and groups are great because they're easy to manage a whole bunch of users instead of one user at a time again uh, like I say working with our groups we could uh, go back into our properties and we could see our members and we could see what they're a member of and again if they're a member of other groups we could go ahead and uh, select those as well and we could see who they're managed by we go go ahead and we could put in their manager's name street and address so there's a lot of things you can do around creating groups again groups are very great uh, for managing uh, people at the end of the day let's say we wanted to add these users to the remote desktop groups now that's a built-in group so we would go to our built-in groups and you can see here we'd go to remote management users or remote desktop users if I double clicked on remote desktop users and I went into members I could click add and I could type in Sally and I could click OK if I wanted to add Jack I would go ahead and type in Jack check name click OK and click apply and click OK so now we've added Jack and Sally to the remote desktop users group and that will allow them now to access uh, their systems using RDP again coming into the built-in groups if I go into the properties you can see it's very similar to the same groups that we have just created over here uh, in our Auckland sales management and our uh, groups over here so there's a lot of groups that we can create again I could right mouse click straight within uh, this blank pane here and say new and I could come down and click you know new computer or new user or a shared folder but in our case if I said group and if you notice we've got universal groups domain groups and distribution groups and distribution groups are used a lot with email and exchange so again we could go ahead and create your different groups it's pretty easy to create that group as you've just seen earlier on I could go ahead and call this group uh, contractors and I could click OK and then we could go ahead and add users to that contractors group if we needed to and if you notice it's a distribution group because I selected distribution if I click security and click apply and click OK and just go into AD you can see now it's changed to a security group again these are just fundamentals getting you familiar with creating groups again it's very easy to delete a group you just select the group and you just say delete and that would delete the group but bear in mind it would also uh, remove all of those permissions for those users it won't delete those users if I went into Auckland sales 
and we double clicked on sales and I went to members we could see we've got two groups uh, two users that are members of that group if I right mouse click and say delete that group and said yes and I went back into my sales you can see I've still got Sally and Jack here and if I right mouse click on Sally and go properties and again I go member of I can see they are a member of the remote desktop users they're no longer a, a member of that other group because we have just deleted that group so as you add users to those groups by right mouse clicking on your user you can actually see what group they are part of the same with Jack Reacher if I right mouse click click properties and go member of I can see what group he's a member of I could also click add I could click advanced I could say find now and I could go ahead and search for a group that I want want him to be a member of and add him to that group as well so again if I come back into my groups and we can say right, we've got this Auckland management group and I went in and said properties and we went to members let's go and add uh, let's type in Jack check his name click apply click OK and if we went back into our uh, management we went back to our sales user went into Jack I went into properties and I said member of you can see now he's a member of that management group so again this is just very fundamental training on getting familiar with creating uh, groups and how groups work so that completes this basic lab and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab hi as you can see I've logged back on to my domain controller now we've learned how to create a user individually which is absolutely fine but what happens if you have to create 500 users or 5,000 users well don't worry I've got you covered on there so the first thing we need to do is we need to create a script we run the script in PowerShell and then it will allow us to import all those users and you would get that um, uh, CSV file or Excel file from your management or from the company you are buying that will have a list of all the users you would convert that Excel file to an Excel CSV file and then you would import that CSV file into Active Directory so what does a CSV file look like well this is what a CSV file looks like as you can see here I've got my users I've got my OU's I've got the username passwords and again this is just a basic CSV file that we're going to use to import all these different users into these different OUs the next thing we need to do is we need to create a PowerShell script so what is our PowerShell script well our PowerShell script is going to look for all of those um, attributes or and markers in our CSV file and it's then going to compare them and it's going to import them into Active Directory don't worry as part of this lab you will have access to a sample uh, file and a sample uh, PowerShell script all you would need to do is to go and change the location of your script before you run it so what we need to do is we go ahead and we create a folder on C Drive and I've called my folder scripts and I've put my PowerShell script in there and I've put my bulk import CSV file in there that's at Excel spreadsheet and in case you're looking for certain attributes that you would need to run if I wanted the attributes say for example of the sales OU I would click on the sales OU and then go to properties and then I would click uh, attribute editor I'd come down to distinguished name and click view and this is what you would copy and paste into your Excel spreadsheet and save it as a CSV file because this is the location of where you want to put those different users and the same if you want to know what your users attributes are that's the same thing you just go properties you click attribute editor and you can kind of scroll down and you can kind of see the the information that you'll need in order to get your user uh, up and running in Active Directory and you just scroll down here and you'll be able to see the user's name uh, so that you get all the right information and once you've got this information you can go ahead and put this information uh, into your user one of the important bits that you'd need would be the SAM account name again you could create this from scratch but that's what a SAM account name looks like so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click uh, cancel and close that out and if we go into our Auckland OU 
we go into management you can see we've got no users in management and we've only got two users in sales but we want to add more users in there so what we can do is we can go to our script I can right mouse click and say run with PowerShell this is going to bring up that PowerShell uh, script for us sorry let me do it again run with PowerShell and if I come down here and I go to my users and I click refresh there's my users you can see there in the sales now we have Peter Parker we have James uh, James Kirk if I move over to management and I just hit refresh there's those users from that CSV file that we had and it's as easy as one two three so that's how you would import multiple users very very quickly you won't go ahead and create them individually again if I right mouse clicked on this user and I went into properties you can see there's his full name there's the last name surname he's at the Auckland office and I can get some more information about that user and this was all populated in that CSV file that you've just seen so it's really a cool way of getting up to speed with importing bulk users into Active Directory on a domain controller so that about completes this lab it's a very very short lab again don't worry you will have access to these files and again you can modify them and change them to suit your needs and you can run them in a live production environment so again I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next video hi as you can see I've gone ahead and I've logged back into the domain controller so how do we create a group policy well that's pretty easy we can just go to start click administrative tools and scroll down until you see group policy management this will open up group policy management and you can see your domains just expand everything and there's our domain and there's our group policy uh, management console and we can go through here and assign a group policy so let's say we've got some people that are misbehaving on our network we've got an OU here called restricted so we can go ahead and we can create a group policy and we can assign it to any OU so I'm going to select the restricted OU I'm going to say create a GPO or a group policy object here and I'll just call this group policy uh, restricted uh, restricted users and I'll click OK and then I'm going to right mouse click on that policy and click edit then I would come down to this policy preferences window and I can go ahead and start changing the policies by clicking administrative templates and I can go to the desktop and you can see here we can go ahead and sort of uh, modify stuff so people are adjusting and dragging the toolbars around we can double click on the toolbars and we can say enable and click apply and click OK we can um, go ahead and scroll down to our start menu and we can add all sorts of policies by clicking on them to enabling them and of course if I come into the network we can go ahead and look at our network connections and we, and we can allow or deny access to certain things if I click on the desktop I've got my desktop here I can say right you guys can't go ahead and uh, change the wallpaper I could go ahead and enable that click apply click OK and uh, and enable that uh, wallpaper name so I can have a look here where my wallpaper is and I can say right I want that full I could call that uh, test and say apply and click OK then they cannot change my company's wallpaper and you can see here the wallpaper has been enabled so they can't go ahead and mess about with the um, when once the machines join to the domain another cool thing is you can go to the programs um, so you can go to the control panel and you can go ahead and add and remove and change stuff and you can hide stuff so that people can't go ahead and change information uh, on the control panel so you might say well I'm going to go ahead and hide that so that you don't have access to that click apply and click OK you can go to personalization we can say I'm not going to allow you to change the fonts you know this is our company standard desktop I'm going to prevent you from changing the mouse pointers because this is a work PC not your home PC and you know there's a whole lot of things that you can uh, set up to prevent stuff and I'll, I'll go ahead and click OK and that policy has been applied 
to that restricted group. And if I click on that restricted group, I can see there's a policy there. And that policy has been linked to those users. So if I drag any users into that restricted group, they are going to inherit that policy. And I'll give you an example. So let's open up Active Directory. And let's go to our New Zealand OU. Let's go to Auckland. And let's go to our sales. And let's say uh, Peter Parker is being a, a naughty boy. We can drag Peter Parker and drop him in there and click yes. Now, Peter Parker will inherit all of those policy settings. And all of a sudden, Peter Parker won't be able to make any changes. Now, group policies are a great way for managing and protecting your environment and for locking down the system so that users don't go to town and your network doesn't become the wild, wild west where everybody's changing and doing things and it gets harder for you to track and control stuff. Also, you'd lock it down so that the users can't install any software. If they need software installed, they have to contact admins. So basically, that's how you create a basic group policy. If I go back to that group policy editor and I click on that policy, I can enforce that policy. I could delete that policy. I could refresh that policy. If I don't want that policy there anymore, I could just go ahead and click uh, delete and it would delete that policy. And you can see where that policy is applied. It's applied to the New Zealand OU, Auckland and restricted. So anything in the restricted folder is going to get that policy. You may say, well, Let's go ahead and add users. Again, I could go ahead and type in uh, Peter, check his name. I could click OK. And of course, I can see we can uh, apply that to those particular users. Obviously, you wouldn't apply it to individual users. That's insane. You would go ahead and you would apply it to a group and you would put that user in a group. And that way, it's easier to manage. So that just gives you a basic fundamental idea of what group policy is. If we click on the details, we can see that policy has been enabled. If we go into the settings, this will actually um, generate a report. And we can go ahead and see what policies have been assigned. And we can filter through and we can go, uh, scroll down and we can actually see what has actually happened. And we can see here we have prohibited the person from adjusting the toolbars. We can see that policy is taking uh, force immediately. Again, coming into de de uh, delegation, we can add authentication users and we can add people to that so they can delegate and work with that policy. So again, this is just giving you a basic fundamental overview of what a group policy is and how to apply that policy. If you no longer needed that policy, you could just click on that policy and you could go ahead and you could uh, delete that policy and say yes and you could hit refresh and then that policy would no longer apply to that OU and if you notice there's no drop down error on any of these OUs so you can see there by default on the groups I've created a group policy and I, it's assigned to a group and that's the best way you want to do things to keep things nice and clean I'm going to the settings again from here I can uh, set it up so that its settings are all disabled, the computer configuration settings are disabled, and a wide range of uh, things that you can do to manage uh, and keep your organization safe. Like I say, there's a whole topic just on group policy. It's one of these things that takes a bit of time to learn, but once you get your head around it, it's definitely the way to go. So I'd like to thank you for viewing, and I look forward to seeing you in the next training video. Hi, in this lab, as you can see, I've logged back onto my Windows uh, 2022 server or Windows 2019 server. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and enable the Active Directory Recycle Bin. Why would we want to do this? Well, the Active Directory Recycle Bin allows us to restore deleted objects within Active Directory. And when I mean deleted objects, I'm talking about groups user accounts, OUs, and etc. stuff related to Active Directory. One of the things that you need to bear in mind, you need to have a minimum of a Windows Server 2008 R2 domain forest functional level before we go ahead and turn this on. So how do we do this? Well, navigate to Server Manager, go to Tools, and go to Active Directory Domains and Trusts, and click on your domain and right mouse click and say, raise domain forest functional level. And you should have a minimum of a Windows Server 2008 R2. 
Uh, hopefully you uh, have Windows Server 2012, 2012 R2, you know, Server 2016, Server 2019, or Server 22. So you need to raise that functional level for this to work. With Windows Server 2012 R2 and up, you shouldn't have a problem with the Active Directory Recycle Bin. The Active Directory Recycle Bin is not available in Windows Server 2008 R2. So I'm going to go ahead and close that down. I'm going to go back to Tools and I'm going to click Active Directory Administrative Center. This is going to open up Active Directory Administrative Center. And if I go to my domain, you will see here I have a little tab under Tasks called uh, Enable Recycle Bin. Bear in mind, once you turn the Recycle Bin on, you cannot turn it off. It's hard coded into Windows. And again, once we enable it, we should see a, another folder appear here that will allow us to actually restore objects. So go ahead and click Enable Recycle Bin. We're going to get a warning saying, once you enable the Recycle Bin, it cannot be disabled. Click OK. We're going to get another little warning saying, well, it's been enabled, but we need to go ahead and refresh Active Directory Administrative Center. So go ahead and click OK, and then hit the Refresh button at the top. Once we've hit the Refresh button at the top, you will notice now we have a folder called deleted objects and if I click in that folder you'll notice we don't have any deleted objects so I'm going to go ahead and close all of that down and I'm going to navigate back to Active Directory users and computers and once I open up Active Directory users and computers I'm going to navigate to my uh, New Zealand OU I'm going to go to Auckland and I've got an OU here called IT support in that IT support OU I have two users, James Bond and Jenna Blake. They both help me with IT support. I also have a security group called IT uh, Support AD Admin where they can go ahead and people that are member of those groups, sorry, can go ahead and create users and OUs and support my users within Active Directory. If I right mouse click on my group and I go to properties and I go to members, you can see Jenna Bond, uh, uh, James uh, Bond and Jenna Blake are both members of that group. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK to close that down. I'm going to right mouse click on Jenna Blake. I'm going to go to properties and I'm going to go to member of and I can see here in her user account she's a, a member of domain users, domain admins and of course she's a member of that uh, IT support group uh, AD admins. So I've said to Jenna, hey Jenna, I need you to go ahead and create another OU and get that OU set up because we want to put new users in that OU. So Jenna didn't understand what I've said. So she went along to the IT support OU. She right mouse clicked and then she said delete. And she went ahead and said delete and she said yes. Now she's deleted that OU, those users in that OU and those users associated with that group. So how do we recover those users? Well, you could do that using a backup, an Active Directory authoritative restore, or you could use the Active Directory recycle bin if you have it enabled. In our case, we have it enabled so we can get out of hot water. So let's navigate to Server Manager. Let's go to Tools. Let's go to Administrative Center. And once Administrative Center uh, opens up, let's go to our domain and there's our deleted objects folder. Double click on that to open that up and there's our deleted users. Now we can go ahead and we can restore those users to a different location or we could go ahead and restore those users back to its original location. And if you notice, we now have a little drop down here saying deleted objects. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to uh, select these uh, users and you can do that by holding down the shift key and selecting all of the users because we want to restore them back to its original location. I can right mouse click and say restore and when I click restore that will restore back to its original location. If I click restore to it's going to ask me where do I want to restore uh, that back to and I could click on the drop down here and I could actually restore them to a different OU if I wanted to. So again it's very very flexible and really cool. So in our case what we want to do is we want to actually restore those users back to that original OU that was deleted and those users should appear in that same OU. So again, once you've got all your users selected, right mouse click and say restore. 
and this will go ahead and restore those users back into Active Directory. So I'm going to go ahead and close this down and I'm going to go ahead and open up my Active Directory users and computers. And as you can see, I do not see my IT support OU. Well, go up to the top and click refresh and there's our IT support uh, OU that was deleted and there's all of our users. If I right mouse click on my uh, IT support admins group and I go to properties, you can see Jenna and uh, James are still part of that group. Everything has been restored back to how it was previously just by using a few simple mouse clicks. Now in the real world, you want to turn on Active Directory Recycle Bin. This will save your bacon many, many times over. So hopefully you've learned a lot in this lab on how to uh, restore uh, deleted OUs, restore uh, users uh, using the Active Directory Recycle Bin. I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Hi, welcome to this training lab, joining a Windows 10 PC to the domain. One of the first things you need to know before you can join a Windows 10 PC to the domain is A, you need to have the admin credentials to join the Windows to the PC domain to begin with. Secondly, you need to be able to ping the domain controller to make sure you can talk to the domain controller. If you can't talk to the domain controller, then you won't be able to join that Windows 10 PC to the domain. So as you can see, I've logged into my Windows 10 PC. In the search, I'm going to type in CMD, which is short for command prompt, press enter. This will bring up the command prompt and I'm going to ping the domain. Pinging the domain means I'm going to actually try and talk to the domain controller. So I'm going to say ping ROC DC03 and ROC DC03 is the name of my domain controller. Once I've typed in my name or IP address of my domain controller, I'm going to press enter and I should get a reply. If I get a reply back, that's good news. That means I can talk to my domain controller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce over to my domain controller. As you can see, I've logged into my domain controller. And just a heads up, any computer running Active Directory users and computers on it is considered a domain controller. As you can see, I've bounced down to my Auckland OU. I've gone to IT support and I've got my IT support users here. These are the users that have permissions to join computers and devices to the domain. So I'm going to select Jenna Blake. I'm going to go properties, uh, right mouse click and go properties, sorry. And then I'm going to go member of. And as you can see, she's a member of the domain admins group. And that's important because you need to be uh, part of this admins group in order to join devices to the Active Directory domain or to your domain. So I'm going to click OK. I'm going to close that down. I'm going to bounce back to my Windows 10 PC. So I'm going to go ahead and join this Windows 10 PC to the domain. So I'm going to click File Explorer. I'm going to go to this computer or computer or whatever your computer name may be and click Properties. And if you notice, this computer is still on a work group. It's not on the domain. So click Advanced System Settings. Go to Computer Name and then click Change and then type in your domain name. In our case, my domain name is Rock Lab. If you don't know what your domain name is, you can always bounce back over to your domain and double click on Active Directory Users and Computers. And then you can see your domain here. Your domain name would be, in my case, rock.com. In your case, it may be a different name. So that's your domain name. So you'll need that as well. So I'm going to minimize that. I'm going to go ahead and type in my domain name and press enter. Once I've typed in my domain name and pressed enter, it's going to ask me for domain credentials in order to join a PC or a device to the domain. So I'm going to go ahead and type in my user, which is Jenna. I'm going to type in her password and press enter or OK. What this is going to do is this is going to go away and check with Active Directory that we have the correct credentials and permissions to join the PC to the domain. If we do get a correct response and we do have those permissions, we're going to get a message that's going to pop up and that will say welcome to the rock.com domain or your domain. So go ahead and click OK. Click OK because this is telling us we need to restart the PC for all of our um, settings to take effect. So click Close and click Restart Now. And this will go ahead and restart that PC. And once that PC restarts, it will join to the domain.
and as you can see our PC has rebooted back up into the user interface so I'm just going to go ahead and log in now when I log into the domain if you notice at the bottom here I've got local admin and other user local admin is the account that I use to create the Windows PC whenever you build a Windows PC from the ground up it'll always be in a workgroup mode until you put it into a domain mode so in our case we want to join this PC to the domain so select other user select the username in my case will be Jenna B I'm gonna go ahead and type in her password and you'll notice here it says sign in to and my domain is called rock your domain might be something else so go ahead and press enter or click the arrow button and this will go ahead and log you in now I've typed in her password incorrect uh, on purpose so that you can see that if you try to type in credentials that are incorrect you won't be able to log into the domain so let's go back and type in her password correctly this time and press enter and as you can see now it's logging Jenna Blake into the domain and this shouldn't take too long to log in so we'll just wait for this to log in quickly and as you can see we have successfully logged into the computer so let's confirm that this computer is on the domain so click file explorer go to this PC right mouse click select properties now when we select properties we can see now underneath the computer name domain comma and workgroup settings we can see here our computer name which is win10client.rock.com and we can see we are on the domain called rock.com so we have successfully joined our computer to the domain you can also go to advanced system settings and you can click computer name and you can see here we are on our domain so you have successfully joined a Windows 10 computer to the domain so I'm going to bounce back over to our domain controller and I'm going to bounce into the computers container in Active Directory so open up Active Directory select the computers container and you will see now we have our Windows 10 client any computer you join to the domain will automatically be added to this container now if you have a look here we've got the OU's and what's the difference between an OU and a container well very very quickly to give you a quick way to identify the differences an OU has a little icon in it where a container is just a plain Windows folder now the difference between a container and an OU is that a container you cannot apply a group policy to but an OU you can an OU we can go ahead and apply a group policy to an OU so again if you see a folder with a little icon in it it's an OU if you see a plain folder like the one that says keys or computers it's a container so let's bounce back over to our Windows 10 PC and as you can see we have successfully joined our Windows 10 PC to our domain and we can go ahead now and reap the benefits of having a computer on a domain but now let's say you had a computer that you no longer wanted it on the domain you needed to take it off the domain for some reason that's pretty easy to do all you do is log on to the computer go to the computer itself so let's do this so I would log on to that computer I will go to file explorer I would right mouse click this computer I'd go to properties I'll click advanced system settings I'll click computer name in the tab at the top here I'll click change I would select work group instead of domain I'll type in a work group name I'll just call it work group and press OK and press OK now bear in mind in order to join a Windows 10 PC to domain and to take it off the domain you need to have domain admin credentials and as you can see it says here welcome to the work group I'm going to go ahead and click OK it's going to ask for a restart for all those settings to take effect I'm going to click OK I'm going to click close and click restart and this is going to go ahead and restart that Windows PC and it will no longer be part of our domain you can see our PC has restarted and if you notice we only have local admin we don't have other user we don't have that other user account that we saw when we joined our Windows 10 PC to the domain that's because we are now on a local work group so we'll just wait for this computer to uh, log us in and then we'll confirm that we are on a work group
So we have logged into our PC, click File Explorer, right mouse click uh, Computer, go to Properties, and as you can see, we are now on a work group. We are no longer part of the domain. If we wanted to join it back to the domain, we would have to select Advanced System Settings, and then we'd have to go to Computer Name and click Change, and then physically rejoin that PC to that domain again by typing in our domain credentials, which would be roc.com, press Enter, type in our username again. Our username would be uh, Jenna B and we'll type in her password and then that would now rejoin that computer to the domain and the reason I'm showing you this sometimes you may have issues in the real world with your Active Directory and sometimes just taking the computer off the domain and rejoining it back to the domain can fix a lot of issues so that's just something to bear in mind so we'll just wait for this PC to reboot up and then we'll complete this lab and as you can see it's booted up so I'll go ahead and log in with other user I'll select Jenna again type in her password press enter and log on to the domain as you can see we've logged in successfully I'm going to click file explorer I'm going to go to this PC right mouse click go properties As you can see we are now back on the domain so in this lab not only did you learn how to join a PC to the domain you learned how to take it off the domain and put it back on the domain I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next video hi welcome to this lab setting up and configuring volume shadow copy service in this lab we are going to go ahead and install and configure this service and the volume shadow copy service allows us to restore deleted files on the fly it should not be used as your sole backup solution I would recommend that you use a third-party backup solution like Beam, Shadow Protect, Aomi or even Acronis it all depends on your environment and on your budget Windows Backup uh, Server is a free solution it comes with Windows Server it's fantastic and it's great to use if you cannot afford to buy a backup solution the reason we want to install, like I said earlier on, Volume Shadow Copy Service, it allows us to restore those deleted files automatically on the fly, almost instantaneously. Another thing is that you need to bear in mind, every time you create a snapshot, it uses, it uses a portion of your drive to store that snapshot. So hence the reason when you're setting up Volume Shadow Copy Service, make sure that you have enough drive space available to accommodate those snapshots. So as you can see I've logged into my server I'm going to click file explorer I'm going to go to this PC and I'm going to go to my data drive I'm going to double click on my data drive and you can see here I've got some files and folders that have been shared out and just to prove to you that they have been shared out I'm going to just bring over my uh, Windows 10 PC you can see there's a map drive and I can see those same folders in there as well so I'm just going to drag this back so we want to install Volume Shadow Copy Service on this drive just in case a user accidentally deletes a file by mistake or IT support delete a file by mistake or a file gets corrupted we can go ahead and restore using a previous version if you don't have the Volume Shadow Copy Service set up the only way to recover those files is through a backup so hopefully you have a backup if you don't have a backup and you don't have Volume Shadow Copy Service set up on your system and your files do fall over well then you're in hot water I have volume shadow copy service running on my live service in the real world so again navigate back to your uh, this PC go back to your drive in my case it's the data drive or the e drive that I want to put uh, or configure should I say the volume shadow copy service so click on your drive right mouse click and then from the drop down select configure shadow copies and as you can see we don't have shadow copies configured on the e drive so I'm going to go ahead and click enable and click yes this is going to enable that shadow copy service uh, for us and it's going to take a snapshot straight away if I bounce over to the settings button you can see here volume shadow copy service needs at least 300 megabytes of free space in order to store each uh, snapshot 
and of course you can dis, uh, change it to lim uh, no limit if you want to however in the real world that's a bad uh, thing to do because it can cause corruptions as the disk gets full if you want to set up a schedule you can click schedule and you can come and choose how you want your schedule to run whether you want it weekly monthly um, once or whether you want it uh, daily it's all up to you you can go ahead and click on the advanced button and you can go ahead and create your own new schedule if you wanted to so I'm going to cancel that for now I'm going to click OK because I'm going to accept the uh, weekly schedule or the daily schedule that's fine I can go ahead and choose which days of the week I want my volume shadow copy service to run I'm going to say Monday Wednesdays and Fridays I'm going to click OK and click OK that's gone ahead and set up that schedule but you're probably saying well I need to create a snapshot now um, so you can go ahead and just hit the create button and if you notice I've hit the create button three times I've created three snapshots here of my data drive and you can see here when the snapshot is going to next run you can see here and you can see if I move over the amount of space that it's used for those three snapshots so I'm going to go ahead and click OK now I'm going to bounce back over to my Windows 10 PC as you can see it over here I'm just going to bring this up so a bit more uh, real estate so we can see what's going on I'm going to go to my C drive and as you can see on my computer sorry not C drive you can see I have my shared folders I'm going to click on my shared folder I can see I've got folders in there and I'm working away and I said well I don't need that I'm going to accidentally delete that folder yeah we don't need that folder let's delete it and management will just delete that oh no I've made a mistake I've deleted those folders how do I recover those folders back well because you're on the network you have to get hold of your IT admin uh, or your IT support guys and say hey guys I'm terribly sorry I've deleted some files by mistake or those files have got corrupted I need them restored immediately because I'm going into a meeting in 10 minutes so that's pretty easy the server admin would jump back onto the server he would right mouse click the E drive he would come down to previous versions and you can see there there's those snapshots so he would select say for example the latest snapshot he would click OK sorry he would <laughs> go to uh, the previous versions he would click on the snapshot and he would click open and once he clicks uh, open you'll see there's the that uh, data from that snapshot and you can tell it's the snapshot because we've got this little uh, clock icon here so he can go ahead and we can double click on our data drive and we can go again and we can select those folders and we can copy them straight back to there and replace those folders now those folders are back and if I bounce back over to my Windows 10 PC and um, go back to my map drive and go back in again just to be 100% sure there's those folders you've restored it the users out of hot water and he can carry on doing his work so I'm just going to um, move this over and go back into our server so our files have all been restored successfully again if I went back into file explorer I went to my e-drive went to data you could see those folders are there so how do we um, see how many snapshots we've taken or how many uh, volumes we have so we can go ahead and list these shadows so I'm going to open up a command prompt by typing in CMD and then I'm going to right mouse click and say run as admin this is going to pop up my admin console and then I could go ahead and I could type in uh, VSS uh, admin list shadows and press enter sorry I can't spell today and press enter and that lists those shadows for me and as you can see here we've got one two three shadows that have been created and again if I bounce back over to my e-drive let's just make this a bit smaller and we drag this to the side here and I go to um, once I'm on my e-drive sorry and I go to configure shadow copies you can see here we've got one two three and the same here one two three so we can list our shadows out now let's say you didn't want those shadows anymore we can go ahead and we can delete those shadows straight from the VSS admin as well I could use the up arrow key up arrow key and instead of saying list uh, shadows I could go ahead and type in delete shadows
and press enter. This will now give me some more um, uh, commands. So I can go ahead and say, you know, I want to delete uh, this from the older shadow for C. In our case, we may want to put that slash and do for C and choose the older shadow to delete with. So we could do that as well. So I could say delete shadows forward space for now we are on E drive. So I'm going to say equals E colon space forward slash oldest and press enter. And that will say, do you want to delete that one shadow copy? Do you want to delete the older shadow copy first? I'm going to say yes and press enter. And that's uh, successfully deleted that shadow copy. So if I close this down, and I come back onto my E drive and I go to configure volume shadow copies, you will notice now I only have two shadows. That's because it's deleted that oldest shadow. If you wanted to delete all the shadows, that's pretty easy too. You can just use this key. Instead of saying um, you only want to delete the oldest shadow, you could just type in ALL for all and say delete all shadows. And I can go ahead and press enter. This will tell me, do you want to delete two shadow copies? Yes, I do. So I'm going to type in Y for yes, and that's deleted those shadow copies. You'll still see them here because uh, it hasn't refreshed. So the best way to do that again is to close this down, right mouse click, go to configure uh, shadow copies, and you'll see now that those shadow copies have been successfully deleted. So you can write a script to trawl through your drive, and once a week it can delete the older shadow copies. That way you're not going to fill your drive space up with um, any uh, volume shadow copies uh, that you don't need. If you don't want the volume shadow copy service and you want to turn it off, that's pretty easy too. You just click disable, you click yes and click OK. And this has now disabled that volume shadow copy service. So we are no longer now taking uh, shadow copies of our Windows E drive. So I'd like to thank you for viewing. And I hope you've learned a lot in this short video and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Hi and welcome to this lab, File Quota Shares. In this lab you're going to learn how to install and configure and work with File Quota Shares. Why do we want to have File Quota Shares set up on our infrastructure? Well, we use File Quota Shares to manage the disk space on various network shares or folders that our users use. The reason we would set up these file quota shares is so that we could manage the amount of storage space that users use. Where I use file quota shares quite a lot in my network environment, I'm talking about a real world environment, is on a user's home drive. Most companies would give a user a home drive to store their personal stuff, but at the end of the day, we don't want that home drive being filled up with other storage space that could be used by the company. You also may have a restriction on other file folders that uh, need to have quotas. And this is where you can go ahead and apply those quotas to those file shares. So remember when you want to set up quotas, there's a few things that we need to do. And the first thing is you must have a shared folder in order for these quotas to work. So what I've done is I've logged into my Windows Server and I've opened up Server Manager. If you need to open up Server Manager, you can click in the start and type in SERV and select Server Manager. Once you're in the Server Manager blade, click Manage. From the drop down, click Roles and Features, and then click Next. Then we want to choose a role based feature installation, click Next. Make sure your server's highlighted, click Next. And then under File and Storage Services, click the little arrow to expand it. Under File and SCSI Services, click that arrow to expand that section of the role. Then you want to scroll down and you want to select File Resource Manager. Click Add Feature. Click Next, and this will go away and install that feature for us. And then click Install, and we'll just give it a minute or two to install. It shouldn't take too long. As you can see, that was very quick. So once the installation has succeeded, click Close. You can always hit the Refresh button here if you wanted to. And of course, you can also come to File Storage Services, and you can do stuff from here. But we're going to do this another way. So go ahead and close that down. Click the Start button, look at Windows Administrative Tools, open up that folder, and from the drop-down, I want you to scroll down and select File Resource Manager. 
this is going to open up our file resource manager and this is where we would go and add our quotas this is where we would go and work with those various folders and shares let's expand uh, quota management and let's just go through this briefly before we set up our first quota you can see here we can go ahead and we're going to create a new quota from scratch or we could go ahead and select from the quota templates a type of quota that we want to use and this is great that we have these templates in place but again they may not suit your needs and you may want to do something a bit more customize uh, customize it more to your environment so under quota management click quotas on the left in the actions pane click create quota then at the top that's asking us for a path and this is the path of the folder that we want to apply that quota to so I'm going to go ahead and click browse I'm going to scroll down to my e-drive I'm going to go to my home drive and I'm going to select Jenna Blake and I'm going to click OK and I'm going to go ahead and give Jenna a hundred megabyte quota again we could define these quotas by coming into the custom properties and we could change stuff as we need now we're going to go ahead and just accept the default for now and we're going to click create we're going to give this quota template a name I'm just going to call it a home drive home drives that's easier for me to understand as an IT person and I'm going to go ahead and click OK and this is going to go ahead and create that quota for us and now as you can see in our list here in the center pane we have our template name that we've created called home drives it's a bit it's applied to Jenna Blake and it's a hundred meg and it's a hard quota so what is the difference between a hard quota and a soft quota well, let's go to edit quota properties by right mouse clicking and then from the drop down select edit edit quota properties and let's just briefly have a look so well a hard quota means that a user cannot exceed the limit so if their limit is 100 meg or 1 gig or 10 gig once they've reached it that's it they cannot install any more files on that server a soft quota means they can go over but then you need to monitor them and again uh, adding a uh, uh, space or adding more uh, bigger storage to your quota all depends on your hard disk size and the amount of storage you have and again if you need more storage space you'd have to contact IT admin in our case we're just going to accept the defaults and we're going to click OK now I'm going to bounce over to my Windows 10 PC and as you can see I'm logged into this Windows 10 PC and if I go to my user you can see I'm logged in as Jenna Blake so I'm going to go ahead and click on the file explorer I'm going to click this PC and you can see here Jenna Blake has a mapped network drive and remember we applied a hundred megabyte quota to that network drive so I'm going to open that up and I'm going to click on this uh, JPEG and go properties and say well okay that's less than hundred meg that's only uh, 555 kilobytes so I'm going to drag that over that copied absolutely fine now Jenna went on holiday and she took a whole lot of snapshots and photos and a bit of videos and she saved them to a, a DVD and now she wants to put that DVD up onto our network share onto her home drive so she's going to go ahead and she's going to drag that over and if you notice she's getting an error it's saying well there's not enough space so her photos and everything is 485 MB however she only has 100 meg and even if she says try again she's still going to get the error it cannot uh, copy that over it says to her, you need to move the files uh, or you need to delete files or you don't have enough space so she's reached her quota so what Jenna needs to do she needs to contact IT and say to IT hey I need some more space please I want to put these photos up so IT have been kind enough and they've said okay no worries Jenna we'll give you some more space as you can see I've bounced back into my server and I've opened up again the files uh, resource manager so I'm going to go ahead and click edit quota properties I'm going to come down here and I'm going to give Jenna 600 MB because she's asked me nicely and I'm going to click OK and that quote has taken effect immediately so Jenna's got 600 MB of free space so hopefully uh, bouncing back onto her Windows 10 PC if we go to properties she only needs 488 MB so let's see if we can copy that over now without an error so I'm going to drag and drop that and there we go it's copied that successfully over so now 
she can actually put some stuff in there. That's because we increased her quota. If I bounce back quickly to our server uh, and open up file uh, resource manager, you can see here, if I hit the refresh button, she's used already 81% of her quota. So in a nutshell, this is how you create quotas, how you increase the size of the quota. Again, if a user doesn't require a quota, it's pretty easy. You just click on the quota and click delete or disable that quota. So there's a lot of things that you can do. We've just scratched the surface when it comes to quota management and uh, disk management in terms of setting up those files and shares for our users. So again, I'd like to thank you for viewing and I hope you've learned how to install uh, the file uh, server manager, how to create your first quota and how to see how much space you use on that first quota and how that quota is used in the real world. Again, bouncing back quickly over to my um, Windows 10 PC. Remember quotas are applied to network folders and there's Jenna's uh, folder. So you need to have a network folder or a network share and inside that network share you need to have folders where you can apply that quota to. If I bounce back over into my server quickly and I'll just open up server, sorry not Active Directory, let's close that down and just open up uh, my file explorer, go to this PC go to my data drive you can see here's my home drive if I select on the users and I come down to Jenna Blake and I go to properties and I go to sharing you can see this is a shared drive so I hope you've learned a lot about creating quotas to get you started with I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next video hi and welcome to this lab setting up NTFS permissions the correct way the reason we would set up NTFS permissions is so that we can lock stuff down and give people access to resources that they need and if someone tries to access those resources and they don't have permissions they will be blocked and they will not be able to use those resources. So how do we do that? So let's go ahead and get this done. So as you can see I've logged onto my server, I'm going to click File Explorer, I'm going to click this PC, I'm going to navigate to my E drive. In my E drive I've got a folder called Data. So now I want to go ahead and create a folder called accounts and we want to lock that folder down so only the people in accounts can have access to that data. So let's create a folder called accounts and once we've created our folder uh, uh, called accounts the next thing we need to do is we need to go and create a security group in Active Directory. So I'm going to double click on Active Directory Users and Computers. I've got the shortcut on my desktop over here. This is going to open up Active Directory Users and Computers. I'm going to navigate uh, to my domain. I'm going to go to my OU and then in my OU here as you can see I've got groups. So I'm going to create a new group by right mouse clicking say new. I'm going to say group. I'm going to call this a security group. So I'm going to call this SG accounts and click OK. I'm going to go and assign some accounting people to this group. So again I'm going to right mouse click, I'm going to say properties, I'm going to say member of, I'm going to click add, I'm going to click advanced and I can click find now. So I'm going to go and add Bruce Banner and Darth Vader to that accounting group. I'm going to click OK, click OK, click apply and click OK. Then I'm going to bounce back into my uh, shared folder that I have because this is the shared folder I'm going to share out with those users, accounting users, so they can access that data. So I'm going to right mouse click on that folder and I'm going to come down to properties. I'm going to go ahead and click security. I'm going to go ahead and click advanced. So what I want to do now is remove everyone from here and only add the accounting group. So I'm going to click disable inheritance, click convert inheritance permissions to explicit permissions and I'm going to go ahead and remove everybody from here. I'm going to click add, I'm going to select a principal, I'm going to type in SG and I'm going to go ahead and say check name, I'm going to select SG accounts, I'm going to click OK and I'm going to give the accounting people full access to this folder. I'm going to go ahead and click OK, I'm going to click apply and click OK. And if you notice now, 
in the accounts properties we only have the group of people that need access to that um, folder so I'm going to click OK I'm going to bring over my Windows 10 PC I've got my Windows 10 PC over here so I'm going to double click but let me show you first of all I'm logged in as another user and if I, I'm logged in as Sally Crane as you can see so I'm going to click on File Explorer I'm going to click this PC I'm going to go to that map drive and in that map drive I've got that folder there called accounts I've got a folder called contractors so if I double click on accounts you will see now Sally cannot get into the accounts folder because she doesn't have access to it only Bruce Banner does or Darth Vader can if I go to contractors the same thing go to HR the same thing however Sally is part of sales so she does have access to the sales folder and she can go in and actually create resources within the sales folder and that's the way to create uh, shared folders or should I say set up permissions on folders so that people don't access resources that they don't need to access you can go out and map that networker drive and the accounting people can log on and all they would have access to is that um, particular uh, folder or in my case like I say I've mapped the data drive and I've just gone one step further instead of having hundreds of map drives here I have all the other folders here but only certain departments have access to certain folders so I hope you've learned a lot about how to create and set up your NTF permissions on a shared drive again we've just touched the very very fundamentals and basics but this should be enough to get you going I'd like to thank you for viewing and look forward to seeing you in the next video hi as you can see I've gone ahead and logged into my server in this very short lab demo we want to learn how to map a network drive to our users and we'll just do this the manual way so that you have a better understanding you can do this via logon scripts and group policy but in our case as you can see I've logged on to my server I've navigated to my eDrive I've selected the data folder and I want to go and map the IT support folder to Jenna because Jenna's responsible for IT support so I'm going to click on the IT support folder I'm going to right mouse click and go properties and I'm going to go to sharing and I can see that's the shared name so I'm going to bounce over to her Windows 10 PC as you can see I've logged into a Windows 10 PC here I'm going to right mouse click I'm going to say from the drop down map network drive I'm going to leave it at D I'm just going to type in the server name which will be backslash backslash ROC hyphen DC03 backslash data backslash IT support that's the server path or the network path of that address so if you have a look here you can see that address there in blue that's highlighted matches that in the folder path and I'm going to go ahead and click finish and there we go it's as easy as that we've just mapped her network drive if I go to this PC you can see now Jenna has access to the IT support folder via a manually mapped network drive I'd like to thank you for viewing I hope you've uh, learned how to map a network drive manually in this training video and I look forward to seeing you in future videos hi welcome to this quick lab Windows Server backup in this lab we are going to install Shadow Protect as our backup solution um, I'm not using the Windows backup because in the real world we don't use the Windows backup we use third-party backup solutions so I'm trying to keep this as real as possible so as you can see if I go to my C drive on my Windows Server sorry file explorer and then go to my F drive I've got a folder that I've created called DC03 backups and I've downloaded Shadow Protect don't worry Shadow Protect is part of this course so you can go and download the file so I'm going to go ahead and install Shadow Protect by clicking on the exe icon this will fire up Shadow Protect I'm going to accept my language as English I'm going to go next and this is going to go away it's going to extract those files and then we will continue with the backup go ahead and accept the agreement go next 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 and this will go ahead and start the installation of Shadow Protect this shouldn't take too long to complete uh, we'll just wait for this installation to uh, finish off and then we can carry on with the lab
you can see that didn't take too long to complete so I'm going to click OK it's going to ask for a restart so yes we need to restart the server and I'm going to go ahead and click finish and let the server reboot and then we'll log back in as you can see I've logged back into my server so let's go and open up Shadow Protect I'm going to click the start button I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to find a folder that would be storage craft as you can see it's over here I'm going to click on the storage craft folder and I'm going to click on shadow protect this is going to fire up the shadow protect console and you'll notice our rock dc03 has got a nice green check mark, mark next to it which means it's ready to go and we can go through the wizard and do a backup here or a restore we can explore a backup we can do a management overview we can get a disk map of what's going on within our environment we can see any backup jobs and destinations and of course backup history so let's go ahead and create a backup so underneath tasks I'm going to click backup I'm going to go ahead and click next and I'm going to backup say uh, C drive and I'm going to go ahead and click next I'm going to browse to where I want C drive backups so I'm going to back it up to F and then I could even browse the F drive if I wanted to and go to the DC30 backups folder that I've created I could click open that could put that folder path in there I could go next I could decide how I'd want to do the backup obviously I can say backup now or backup later weekly or monthly again this is not a shadow protect course it's just a course on showing you how to get up and running with shadow protect backup click next click next and click the execute checkbox and click finish and this will execute the backup and you'll notice the backup job will start running it shouldn't take too long to do this backup As you can see the backup has completed we can look at our backup history and we can see what was going on there again if I navigate to my F drive you can see there's my backup of my C drive if I wanted to explore that backup it's pretty easy to I could just go ahead and say explore backup I could go next I could browse to my backup on my C drive I'm sorry on my F drive I could select the backup click open and click next this will mount it as G click next and click finish and this will go ahead and mount the backup as a virtual drive and then we can drag and drop files back up as we would like back to the original location and you can see here I've got this folder scripts so if I needed to back up this folder or copy this off I could copy that back and that uh, close that backup down and dismount that backup again when we come into our uh, backup here you'd have to click under task dismount backup image click next select the G drive click next and click finish and that would dismount that backup again most companies in the real world would use a third-party solution because it's much more flexible than the Windows backup so this gives you a basic understanding of how to run shadow protect uh, in your environment and get you up and running again there's a whole course just on shadow protect but this just gives you a basic uh, fundamental uh, overview of installing a third party solution in your infrastructure. So I would like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next labs.